Uh, today we're particularly honored not only to have the mayor of Atlanta with us, but also to have the founder of our organization here to introduce, uh, introduce the mayor of Atlanta. Uh, Mr. Rappaport, Mr. Jerome Lyle Rappaport, uh, is a graduate of this school and a graduate of uh, Harvard College. And uh, among his many honors was, uh, uh, the, I guess his most recent honor was last night, the Institute of Human Relations of the American Jewish Committee uh, awarded him with uh, the Humanitarian Award, I believe uh, it was called, at a testimonial dinner last night that I was honored to attend. Um, I learned a lot about him. He's really a very accomplished person, and um, I just want to just give you a sense of some of the things that he's done. In addition to founding this organization and giving us uh, uh, generous support over the years, he uh, served as assistant campaign manager for Mayor John Hines. He organized the new Boston Committee, which has served as a catalyst for change in Boston. He has endowed two Rappaport Urban Fellowships at the Kennedy School and uh, also the Rappaport Alumni Achievement Award at Simmons College Graduate School of Management. He's also established a Rappaport Scholarship at the Harvard Medical School for research on Alzheimer's disease, has served as trustee or director of the Boston Opera Company, the Cantata Singers, the Charles Theater, the Brattle Theater Group, on and on and on. He's a, a well-respected and a very uh, prominent developer in the city of Boston, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Jerome Lyle Rappaport. I just uh, want to say that it's a, obviously a, a wonderful time for me to come back here. Uh, it, I hate to tell you, but it uh, is 47, I guess what, 47, must be 42, 43 years ago that we set up the law school. It was a very different institution then. And I'm not going to take a lot of time describing those differences, but essentially it was that, that public affairs really did not have any part of the agenda at the law school. It was a terribly professionally oriented uh, school and very narrow based. That may reflect some controversies that are going on now, but it's, it's, it, for me then, it simply represented the fact that lawyers, when they graduated, had, a, had an extensive involvement in public affairs, and the law school was not preparing us terribly well for that. And it was vitally important, it seemed to me, for people just not to be on a complete sabbatical from the kind of issues that over time they were going to have to they, they were, by their own inclination and, and by their own sense of responsibility, uh, were going to be inclined to, uh, uh, to have to participate and comprehend. So that the forum uh, uh, seemed to be the kind of instrument, and we're dealing now at a time when, I mean, you people are inundated with forums. I look at the, <laughs> the bulletin board, and apart from the bulletin board, you just have to look at TV all the time. We're dealing with a time when, when uh, you only had radio and you only had a couple of couple of public affairs broadcasts that were going on. So the value of the, of the forum in terms of creating a, creating an, a, 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 a place to uh, uh, have the critical issues of the time uh, debated and discussed was important. Uh, subsequently, as it has been indicated, my interest has been in, in urban affairs. And I very much wanted to, uh, to encourage uh, all of you to find the same kind of excitement and challenge uh, in participating in, 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 in local governmental affairs and the development of our cities and the solving of the major urban problems that exist and therefore have tried to encourage the, city, the, uh, uh, the forum to, uh, to give that sense of direction. And uh, when the uh, Mayor Jackson was going to come to my meeting last night, it seemed most appropriate that uh, even on short notice that, uh, uh, that he have, that he present his perspective on the on the future of the American city. Uh, Maynard uh, uh, has been, pro is probably is perceived as one of the most dynamic mayors uh, in the country. Uh, he also graduated very, very young. As a matter of fact, he beat me. He graduated 18 from Morehouse uh, College, went on to become a lawyer. He really represents the kind of, of, of responsible participation in the leadership uh, that's so desperately needed. And uh, as I'm sure he's going to urge you, uh, uh, the cities need the kind of participation that you represent. And uh, he has provided it in Atlanta. He served as mayor for two terms. Uh, he went back to, uh, to private practice. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, seeing the void of, of leadership uh, at the age of 50, when it's, I can tell you it's a lot easier not to go out and campaign and assume the responsibility for, uh, for running the city and uh, facing those new challenges again. 
uh, out of his own sense of commitment, he went back. And uh, the level of his service and the respect that he that he has within the community, I, I guess, is uh, best exemplified by the fact that he got 80 percent of the vote. He represents the kind of unifying force that the cities need. Uh, he is a, an ideal spokesman for the Rappaport Urban Lecture, and I must say I'm honored to, uh, to introduce him to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it very much. I'm glad to be in an institution which, after you founded it, is still going on and still making um, important contributions. Uh, I thank Mr. Wilson for his help and uh, Mr. Bressman for attending the dinner last night as well. Glad to see some people I know here and glad to see some I don't know. I can make new friends. When I see a member of our church who is visiting on the campus as a as an administrator, a young woman who interned at Chapman and Cutler, the law firm I left when I was re-elected um, in Atlanta, and two young men uh, whom I knew from the time they were born, and whose parents are good friends of mine. I um, thank you for inviting me, and what I intend to do, as I understand we're over at 5 o'clock, is that right? Okay. <laughs> you, you need to be specific with the of a person who descended from three generations of Baptist preachers on the question of how long one talks. <laughs> you, need, you need to say exactly at five o'clock, Mina, stop talking, right? I have a congenital infirmity. I come to you today um, as one who loves the law. And through a time when I had uh, quite a struggle Father died when I was 15, and we had to really get out and hustle, one of six children and so forth. And mother was a college languages professor. They didn't make a lot of money and so forth. But we, uh, the dream of being a lawyer was one I never, ever left. And yet here I am, having left the practice of law and having gone back into public service. And I want to tell you a little bit about why I made that decision and about why I think that's important to all of us in this country. The, um, the reason I ran for office again, uh, we're in a city which has a two-term limitation. So I was mayor for two terms, came out, supported Andy Young, encouraged him to run. He ran, served two terms. He's running for governor now. I wanted to run for mayor again, ran last year, as Mr. Rappaport said. I took a two-thirds cut in my income because I made the mistake of turning 50 and asking myself what is it I truly, deeply in my heart wanted to do. And the more I talked to my friends and people I respected, and the more I heard them say that they would not get caught dead in politics, the more convinced I became that those who wanted to make a difference had better go on and get that get that going, no matter what the sacrifice, because I think we're running out of time. And I think you're about to go out into a nation of cities where 80 percent of the people live on 2 percent of the land, a nation that has no comprehensive national urban policy, a nation where 46 out of the 50 states have no state urban policies. where black people are six times more likely to be killed to be the victims of homicide than whites. For young people, black, brown, and white, Republican, and Democrat, rich and poor, are the subject to an, an avalanche, are the victims of an avalanche of drugs. A scourge that literally threatens to undo the nation. I'm not a prophet of doom. I'm a, I'm a positive person. I used to live in this town, used to work here, used to teach people how to sell encyclopedias door to door. For P.F. Collier. I ran the office in Lawrence, Massachusetts, lived in Andover, recruited people. We taught, we lived, and I still live, the, the power of positive thinking. I believe in it. It's a technique. 
and a state of mind. And I practice it. When they told me when I was mayor before, four months into being mayor, rookie mayor, that we could not build this new airport, I mean, these are all the experts, all the experts in a room, about 15 of them. And I told them, if they take care of the finance, I take care of the politics, and uh, that airport is there today. It's, it's the busiest airport in the world and takeoffs and landings. It was because I didn't even stop to think about it. I was trained to react that way. So I'm not a prophet of doom, but I try to be an accurate analyst of reality and if I were you about to come out and to go into law firms probably in major cities around the country or go on the bench or clerk for great judges or whatever the case may be I'd be deeply concerned about living in a nation that has no road map for its city And where more and more you and those you represent, the intelligentsia, the learned, from whatever background you may come because of this education, the gifted, are swearing that you would never touch politics with a 10-foot pole. The more that happens, the worse off we get because if the cream does not rise to the top, the crud will. I don't know about you, but um, if I were you, I would not want to live my life just complaining about those people in City Hall and those folks in the county courthouse, those people in state government and those, those people in the, in the Congress. What's happening is, is that more and more, even as many good people run for office, There are those running who are unprincipled and unprepared to run multi-billion dollar corporations that operate under public scrutiny and who will set the policies by which you will live as long as you live in this country. Public policy controls almost every aspect of our lives. tells us when to go to school, where to go to school, who goes to school, at what age one goes to school, who teaches in school, how much they're paid, whether ketchup is a vegetable or not, how fast to drive our cars, what directions we can drive our cars, what goes in the gas tank, whether anything goes in the gas tank. All matters of public policy. Can women vote? Can black people sit at the front of the bus? What's our policy as a nation toward South Africa, toward Cuba, toward the USSR? All matters of public policy. Who decides? The people you and I elect make those decisions. I know that from the Rockefellers to the No Fellows, people try to influence public officials, but they don't set public policy. They don't set it. In this country, only elected officials set public policy. It is the law. Somebody raises his hand or her hand and votes. Somebody signs a paper, someone is elected, and that becomes a policy. <clears throat> now, the great part about all this is that I believe what, what we are seeing from dope to crime to third-class education to homelessness, mothers and babies on the street, mothers working but earning only a minimum wage, minimum wage so inadequate that she's got to choose either housing or child care cannot afford both. That's not fiction, that's reality. 20% of our homeless are mothers and babies. 
in a successful American city. Number one in quality of life in the nation, December 81. Staying in the top 12 ever since. Fifth consecutive year, the preferred choice for business, for doing business in America. Cushman and Wakefield, their annual poll. Successful city, booming. But I don't mean boom like boom and then the bust, steady. Some slowing down now, not as strong as before, but still growing, improving. We don't just want to grow, we want to improve. All these things are decided by people we elect. And what's the great part? The happy part about this is that the most perfect revolutionary act in a democracy takes place at the ballot box. We can make a difference. That's the message. No reason to despair, provided we're prepared to sacrifice and to make a difference. <clears throat> About 70 years, everybody in this room is going to be dead. In a box, in the ground. or cremated, and ashes blown to the wind. Everybody. Maybe one or two will live to be past 90. Not many. And I don't care how much money you make, you'll never remember you for your money. Never, ever, for your money. You know, Camus, great French philosopher, talked about how absurd um, life seems to be. We keep on getting ready for something. At the point at which we've achieved the greatest amount of wealth and wisdom, we die. He said, this doesn't seem to make sense. It seems to be absurd. If the only thing waiting for us down the road is death, why even bother to live? And he suggested that at least two things redeem life and help life to make sense. One is love, the other is change. He didn't define which kind of love he meant, you know, which of the Greek classifications, but the concept of change is as compelling to me as is the concept of love on this issue. What kind of change? The answer is some kind of change. What is the mandate? I think Guthrie and Villa talked about the obstinate daily revolt against the ordinariness of our lives. Obstinate daily revolt against the ordinariness of our lives. <clears throat> so when I walk back in the city hall in Atlanta, or when I go into any governmental building in the country and and I see the rampant negativism. When I see bureaucratic intransigence, when I see people who are more adept at telling me why they cannot do things, rather than focusing on how to get the job done, then I'm going to be awfully impatient, was and am. So we're in the process of a lot of changes. <coughs> I've reorganized the management team. Instead of a chief administrative officer, I have a team of five people I work with now. Tighter span of control for me, and a tighter span of control for each of them. Goals that we negotiated. Accountability is more fixed. Flexibility is more evident. It's more fun. You know, we don't get paid a whole lot, right? 
I got a senior VP from Coca-Cola USA who's a specialist in strategic planning and marketing management information systems to come in as our executive officer for development and administration. We're going to see ourselves now as a master developer. We're in business to protect our neighborhoods, enhance the quality of life, develop our city in ways that are consistent with our plan. <coughs> We're going to put everybody in the city government, every city employee, top to bottom, on an incentive pay basis. If the city council supports the plan, I've already told them about it, it'll become effective with the 91 budget. That budget will be adopted in the first quarter of next year. <coughs> Excuse me. So incentives in the public sector, why to get more done? Increase productivity, we'll have a base pay plus incentive package. And why is that important? I'm trying to leave as much time to your questions as possible, so I'm going to cut my remarks short. I'll be through in five minutes. It's important to have public, the public sector deliver on its promises. Because people are losing faith. The people are sick and tired of more studies and more commissions and more meetings and more committees and more this and that. And so forth. What's the big problem? I don't know. Let's call a committee. Set up a committee. Great. What did you get? We got a study. That's fine. That's process. Where's the product? Well, we're working on it. What are you going to do? I'm going to call another meeting. What about the fact that the swimming pool is closed in Thomasville Heights because the drug dealers ran off an armed guard? We better have a meeting on that. Damn the meeting. Get some police and put shotguns in their hands if you have to and go down there and secure the pool for the people. Don't let anybody run our children off. Action now. The people are sick and tired of committees and meetings and this and that and this and that. Mishmash. We have a chance to turn our nation around. We can do it. It can be done. These problems are soluble. But only if we have the will to act and if we're determined to act. Well, it won't look good if you get some police down there with shotguns trying to scare the pool. It doesn't look good either that drug dealers would run off an armed guard. Now, what do we want to do? Look bad that way, or in the eyes of some people, look bad over here while the kids can use that pool in the summer. Well, I thought you were such a liberal, Maynard. I was. I still am in some ways. But I'm far less concerned about labels than I am concerned about results. I want the bottom line. This is the decade of the bottom line. You either produce or hush. This is the decade of the bottom line. Problems that we're facing now are coming at us in such a rush. We don't have another 20 years to kind of discuss the matter. That luxury is gone. Nine years ago, there was no AIDS, as far as we knew. Hadn't been identified, had not been named. 1981, I'm talking about the, the federal budget year. FY91, FY right? No AIDS mentioned because there was no such thing. Not a single federal program targeting the homeless in the fiscal year 81 federal budget because that was not considered to be a problem. It was not at that time compared to what it is now. Homelessness. 
not identify it as a, as a problem, not considered to be a problem in America, 1981, nine years ago. Now these are mounting our minds and our spirits and our awareness in leaps and bounds. And we've got to get busy to take care of business. And everybody's got to sacrifice. Everybody's got to pay something of a price to make it, make it happen. Yeah, I remember her. She came out and she convinced uh, the nation. She began to move to convince the nation that um, a way to pay off the SNL mess was not to penalize America and the budget, but to set up a national mortgage exchange. And she's figured out a way to solve the fungibility problem. So you can have instantaneous massive trades in mortgage-backed securities. And yes, you just finished Harvard Law School. Yes, I remember him. He's the guy who organized the case to correct the census undercount in America once and for all. And who looked at the case that Detroit brought that was thrown out, that Philadelphia brought that was thrown out, that New York brought that was thrown out. But looked at the case that Atlanta brought years ago, I'm the one who took it there, and the fact that 40 governments came under that case and they were never thrown out, but that after I left office and people decided to withdraw, they did so, but the reason it was not thrown out was the constitutional argument. And yes, I remember that guy, 70 years from now, he's the one who set America straight on the census. The argument being that constitutionally, how can you reapportion when you undercount portions of the population by 7 to 10 percent? When in 1970 the undercount of African Americans was admitted by the government five years later to be 7.7 percent, 9.9 percent black males, 5.5 percent black females, and that was, in our opinion, that admission was off the mark. I found the Committee on the Census Undercount with the U.S. Conference of Mayors that 15 mayors, Republican, Democrat, white, brown, and black, liberal, moderate, conservative. Five-member staff, Melvin Mister, interested in that issue, I urge you to invite him to Harvard. The Citibank now became an investment banker, was on the staff of the U.S. Conference of Mayors at the time, ran the staff of five. They came back and found out that if America had been counted correctly, they believe that we would have found Mississippi was 51% black. Alabama was 46% black in 1970. The five blackest states are right there with each other. Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. Not in that order. And out of those five blackest states, three of them are the best integrated states in America in public schools. Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia compared to the least integrated in public schools, and guess where they are? Illinois, New York, New Jersey, another one, I've forgotten what it is, but um, yeah, I remember him, he, he said it right on the census. You cannot reapportion legislative districts of the U.S. Congress. You don't know how to draw the line that way when you don't know how many people are there. Those 15 mayors in this committee unanimously agreed, unanimously now. And the undercount in 1970 was not 7.7% .7 of African Americans. It was more like 11%. So we designed in 1978, proposed the Carter administration, really the Census Bureau, as a bureaucracy that has been there for a long time, chained in the basement. And they don't, I don't know about any conspiracy notions, well, I'm not even into that stuff. What I'm going to tell you is the reality. The reality is that they're not responsive, for whatever reason. And they won't come to grips with the reality also of two national studies, plus our study, that proves that you cannot count America correctly now 
the way they're trying to. You cannot do it. Too big, too mobile. So what I believe we need to do, and somebody's going to remember for putting this into place, for changing the public policy on this, for understanding at least 50 to 60 federal programs worth over $100 billion to the cities, relying whole or in part on population, undercount a city to get less money, but on Monday morning, the folks who were not counted are standing in line. So to get this accurate count, somebody's got to bring the case. Somebody's got to make it happen. You can handle it. If you got the documents the city of Atlanta had, and if you don't do it, we'll do it again. No matter what something that is not theirs, we're talking about fair, just that which is owed. You've got to have safer cities, better housed cities, better educated cities, better employed and trained, and a better quality of life, including environmentally safe, cleaner and greener. If I had another hour and a half, I could show you in the budget proposed by the administration at this time how the very ways where incentives could be used to develop the economy to inspire investment that those ways are being killed. UDAG killed. Community Development Block Grant killed. And it goes on and goes on and goes on. Even the programs the Republicans said were supposed to be kind of Republican type programs, you know, invest a dollar and leverage two. Turn out that's not a bad idea. But now that we have them, they want to kill them. And it's not just Republicans' fault. We've got a democratically controlled Congress. Republicans and Democrats are failing the cities. The Congress is not taking care of business. Neither is the White House. One final thing, Harvard has so much money it doesn't even know what to do with it. Morehouse doesn't. Spellman doesn't. Clark AU does not. As we think about the program's long range, if we think about the situation is going on here now. I hope you'll focus on that issue, whatever it may be, whatever de decisions you decide to make are up to you. I'm not interfering in that. But I ask you all to look at the bigger picture as well. And that is that there are schools that are producing leaders trying to make it that need help. And a, a university like Harvard could be of great help. A sister-school relationship, whatever you call it, brother-sister satellite relationship, I don't care what you call it. But it can make a big difference. We're talking about schools with endowments of 40 million, where the biggest is Hampton with 77 or 85 million dollars, total endowment, best endowed, maybe 90 now. What's your endowment here? Five billion. I was right. Never miss it. I wish you all would think about that. And in a respectful way, maybe suggest to your administration that this kind of a program be undertaken in a serious way. Spelman was founded by New Englanders, a women's college in Atlanta, to Rockefeller School, basically. So there's precedent for that. I thank you for your attention. The final thing I want to say to you is that um, we can change how we live through public policy. That depends on how we vote and how we organize. So I want us not just to be mad, but to be aggressive. 
not just to be frustrated, but to be active, to organize, set a goal, make a difference. If you don't know how to start, when you leave this room today, call one person you know. Think about what you believe is important to do and begin to organize one person at a time, one day at a time, one issue at a time. And you can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions, please? Yes, sir. Good man. I, I can tell by looking at you, a man of distinction and. Uh, I withdraw, in that case, I withdraw the comment. I was, <laughs> obviously, I was mistaken. But, uh. Sure. I think the chances are getting better every day for um, candidates who have different ideologies or of different races, African-American candidates, Hispanic-American candidates, others. But I think we have a long way to go in many ways. Uh, Virginia gives us hope, but we need to remember that in Virginia there was no primary. The nomination was in a convention process. There was no primary. Andy has a primary. He's got to win the nomination. Out of 50 American states, 10 states, and guess where they are? All in the South. Have a requirement that if you don't get a majority the first time out, you've got to have a runoff. 50 states do not have that requirement. So Andy has got to, Andy's out there, uh, and he's against formidable opposition. The Lieutenant Governor, Zell Miller, has been the Lieutenant Governor of 16 years, decided this was his time, he had to make it. He's leading in the polls, Andy is uh, holding second. Most people believe that Andy will be in the runoff, and the only issue is who else will be in the runoff with Andy, and that there will be a runoff. I think that's likely. I think it's almost, uh, I mean, Barring some unforeseen circumstance, that's what I think is going to happen. There'll be a runoff. I think Andy will be in it. Can he win that? I don't know. But if he wins the nomination, in my opinion, he'll be the next governor of Georgia. I think he'll have a lot of support. But more than that, even the Democrats who may not be real crazy about Andy, and this is not just a racial thing. And he's got a long public record with which a lot of people disagree. Conservatives consider him to be too liberal. So even if he were white, he would not be their fair-haired boy. But in Georgia, the Democratic powers that be, I think, like Republicans less. And so I think that Andy would be... Um, supported by the, um, the strong, uh, the democratic uh, power structure of Georgia if he were to win the nomination. Now to get there, he's got a, he's got a, it's a real battle and it's too soon to tell. Qualifying is going on this week. Uh, just incidentally, you know, Andy began to push for the Olympics. We are America's chosen city for the 1996 Olympics. We had the competition among American cities last year. Atlanta won. That's what this button is about. 
its pen. So we're the only American city that can host the United States Olympics if we win against the other cities in the world that are competing. There are five others, Manchester, Melbourne, Belgrade, Athens, and Toronto. I just got back from Belgrade yesterday because there are 28 members of the International Olympic Committee over there. And I met and shook the hands of 27 of them in two and a half days. And there'll be 40 in Barcelona the end of May, and I'll be there too. But I left a whole team of eight people over there in, in, um, in Belgrade um, called the Atlanta Organizing Committee. They're not with the city government. It's set up as a special organizing committee. Well, the vote is September the 18th, right? September the 18th was the vote. The primary originally was scheduled for September after the 18th, two, three, four days after the 18th of September. In other words, two, three days after the vote on the Olympics. Two years ago to prove to you that there are some Georgians who do plan ahead. Somebody in the legislature moved the primary up from that date in September to July. The thinking was that if we got the Olympics and we were riding a crest into the primary and we'll get the nomination, and it clearly will help him if we get the Olympics, but we won't know by the time the struggle with the primary is on. So uh, I'm not saying that that's why the date was moved. I don't know why it was moved, but it sure does look peculiar. <laughs> yes, sir. Excuse me, one other thing. Prospects for the future depends on the person. It also depends on racism. The racial thing um, is going to be a factor for a long time. Is it enough of a factor to block somebody who is exceptional? The answer is, I don't think so. But it will depend. It will vary from place to place. I think Mississippi can elect a black governor in the next election, if one runs. But it depends on the quality of the person. So the issue is not just a black person, but Joe or Mary or whoever it is. And what are their qualities? What do they bring to it? A jumping full bone in the public expect to win the first race one runs, that may happen. It may not happen. So no matter, no matter what one's educational background, maybe you gotta pay some dues. You've got to learn the system, get to be known, get to be trusted. Make sure your word is your bond. Impeccably honest. And have a vision. And have a plan. And you want to do two things that people want to educate and motivate. And there's a need for more leaders to become politicians. Desperate need. I encourage you in your in your direction. Yes, sir. Well, the answer is that some students who are, who are more concerned with what they will earn, and that, by the way, is not a, it's not, a, not a small matter of concern. I'm not denigrating the importance of that. Uh, but that's not going to make or break one's life, one, one's life one, the meaning of one's life. Uh, we can attract students, um, and we need to do that, by the way, graduates into the public sector by um, special internships. There used to be something called the Urban Fellowship. This guy I got from Coca-Cola, by the way, John Reed, um, was a senior VP of Coca-Cola, but was an urban fellow with Atlanta in 1976. That's when he got infected with the bug, the public service bug. He, he took a huge cut in his income to take this job. 
try, that's one of the ways. And the other would be uh, to present for public sectors and recruiting graduates to present an interesting and attractive program that has meaning, where you can see a difference that you can make. If you just want to be a bureaucrat shuffling papers, won't succeed in my opinion. Get a project with a goal. 